Uh, joining us will be Steve Berger. Uh, he's a grain and livestock farm, uh, 15,000 head of hog, uh, and has been doing no-till for 38 years. Steve and his wife Julie are um, very involved uh, in the local community and in the Rotary Club. Uh, he's also a member of the Washington County Pork Producers um, and uh, has a, a BS from, the Iowa, from Iowa State University. Well, please, please join me in welcoming Steve. Do I need to hold some of the posters? No, I'm fine. Well, thank you for inviting me, and um, I'm glad to be here, and it's actually my um, almost hometown. I went to school here in Kelowna, and in Kelowna two or three times a day, and uh, first time to hear Francis Tickey speak, and enjoyed hearing him speak, and uh, a lot of good ideas shared there. Uh, this weekend, so we just finished up uh, drilling our soybeans, so we're coming through a pretty busy time now, and uh, so we just uh, took a picture out of the back of the tractor cab today, and then we are... Uh, drilling soybeans here into cereal rye, and that's probably some of the tallest rye we've uh, uh, drilled into this year because of the open winter. And uh, I guess the whole point is, you know, we're trying to um, get a living crop growing and take that nitrogen up, take that uh, the other nutrients up, stop our soil erosion, and try to improve um, our soil. Another picture of that tall rye, see the shovel handle there? And so we've got rye in excess of seven feet, so there is a lot of biomass. <laughs> that isn't every year. It, you know, some years, you know, you, you'll you be challenged to maybe get uh, rye, you know, eight to ten inches tall. In that little right uh, corner, the new for us was a uh, roller crimper. I had never, never used one, and uh, I had a neighbor from Kyoto that has one, and he would like to maybe start manufacturing those maybe sometime. And... Uh, I really needed something to handle that biomass there. Um, that was a little bit more than what I was used to uh, handling. And so it's um, it was a challenge, and so we just happened to have a roller cripper available, and um, that worked pretty good. We got started in no-till cover cropping about, or no-till about uh, 38, 39 years ago. And um, I got a call. Or my dad got a call from the extension director, who was Jim Freer, and Jim's sitting here right now. I didn't know Jim was going to be here. And uh, Jim asked uh, to come to a meeting down in Washington. He was uh, hosting uh, several farmers and wanted to get farmers started in no-till. And one of the reasons we wanted to get started in no-till was to stop the soil erosion. Uh, farming uh, corn and soybeans on steep slopes, we get the erosion, the sedimentation. So it really wasn't water quality or the hypoxia thing wasn't even in, um, in, you know, even on our minds, but it was just basically soil erosion coming off the hill. So Jim had, uh, was um, promoting the no-till farming, and so we got started the following spring in uh, 1979. We'd seeded a cereal rye crop in the fall of 78, and so in 1979, the spring, we had our first, um, actually, no-till, and um, this happens to be in a rye cover crop. You know, we weren't even thinking cover crop. I didn't know what a cover crop was, but Jim took this picture. This was back in about May 5th of 79, and um, I was actually in my, one of my 4-H projects, and so we got started uh, basically in no-till. And uh, really the only thing unique about us is, is we never really went away from no-till. We started doing it, and we continue to do it um, every year since. And, um, you know, some years we had no-till more than others, and sometimes we'd go away from it, but... Um, a majority of our acres have been continuously no-tilled now for about 38 to 39 years. It'll probably be our 39th year. And so as we went into the no-till, you know, we learned slowly. There were things that didn't work. Our machinery wasn't really set up. You know, this actually this corn planter here was a brand new corn planter that we um, bought from John Kinzenbaugh. It was the first really no-till planter. We bought that from John Kinzenbaugh himself brought it home in the back of a truck and put it together. And there were no road cleaners, there wasn't anything on that planter, you know, as we would have today, and so it was a learning process. And so as we get into cover crops, it's going to be that, that same kind of learning process. It kind of ebb and flows in our learning. So I thank Jim uh, Freer. Uh, it's just basically leadership. We had strong extension council. We had, uh, we had the... the Soil conservation. Soil conservation is NRCS now, but back in those days it was that SCS, the Soil Conservation Service. And then we also had a really good buy-in from the retail outlets. So like the um, 
the companies that would sell fertilizers and, and, and chemicals. And so we had the extension, we had the retail outlets, and we had strong soil conservation and good farmer leadership. And so when Francis talks about how do we get started, I really think it takes strong leadership in, the, in your local uh, towns and communities. And when you see somebody successful at growing cover crops, you know, I think it kind of spreads, you know, in that area. Now, Francis is right on the, the acres. It's not very impressive if you look at the total acres of cover crop that has um, been grown, you know, in the state of Iowa. But here locally, the numbers are quite are quite higher, and that comes from just the, from the leadership in the past. And so what we try to do, and what my dad, who passed away here a couple of years, what we've been trying to do is try to teach farmers to be successful. If we can make this system work, and I mean no-till and cover crops and a corn and bean rotation, if we can make this system work, then farmers will adopt it. You know, if it doesn't work, and what I mean if we don't get the yields in our corn and soybeans, then, um, then it's not going to work. So that's what we spend quite a bit of our time doing, and I spend a lot of time you know, talking to uh, farm, farm groups, and uh, specifically how can we integrate cover crops um, you know, in our system. And so the way I look at it, my thought process is if I'm going to talk to a farmer is I start with a base of no-till. We're going to, if we want to really improve soil quality, we want to stop the tillage. We want to stop, every time you till the soil, you've got to introduce oxygen into it. Oxygen comes in there and it pulls out the carbon, CO2, so you get the oxidation. So we actually are losing carbon, so we want to basically, we want to stop the tillage as the base, and we did that. We started that about, you know, 38 to 40 years ago, and we got along pretty well, and, but what we noticed, we were missing something. We still didn't have enough cover on our farms. You know, we've been no-tilling, we got into the 1990s, the mid-90s, and, you know, 15 years of continuous no-till, you know. Our organic matters really weren't going up, and, which was kind of a disappointment. You know, we kind of thought once we, we thought once we got the no-till, that would be the be-end all to everything. And, and so that's when we started adding the cover crop. We needed that living root. We needed that, like Francis says, you know, you only have corn and soybeans growing, you know, five months out of the year. You need to have something carry you throughout the year. So that's when we added the cover crop. And so through the photosynthesis and the deep root systems and the, the nutrient cycling, that really helps improve your soils and it also improves um, your organic matter. And as you um, add cover, if you start with the no-till, you stop the tillage, and the second thing is you keep a, a green plant growing. In my case, it's cereal rye. There's scores and scores of cover crops, or hundreds of cover crops. And so the one I talk about, or the one we pretty much use, is cereal rye because it works good in these latitudes here. And so once you start no-tilling and add the cover crop, underneath your feet, that just changes the entire environment. Everything below, I mean, the, the microbial process changes based from what, you know, if you were doing a tillage and you go to no-till, you start to have more mycorrhiza fungi that in turn improves the soil and then in, in turn improves your crop yields. And you've got to remember, if you want to get widespread adoption, you know, we gotta we gotta produce food for the world. The farmers got to, you know, um, to make some money growing crops. A lot of the perception is if you no-till and you cover crop, you have poor yields, and we're not going to do that. And indeed, you can. There's a lot of train wrecks out there. You know, you know, we've learned a lot about those train wrecks. And so, what we try to do is spend a lot of time. How do we get from here down to here? You know, how can we help? You know help the farmer adopt it. And I think we feel like if we're successful in helping farmers learn how to do that, we'll get uh, more widespread adoption. And so that's what we're doing. We're no-tailing here. And so I look at my perspective and how can we help farmers with management practices and in, in building soil health. And this is what I do a lot. I talk to farmers that, that is right, that has been terminated, and now we got the soybeans coming up through it. Um, we're planting soybeans here in a lot of different uh, pictures. You know, sometimes we plant in the rye that's the nest that's been sprayed. We still chemically terminate, I'd say, 99.9% .9 of our crops. You know, like I say, this is a, you know, we're always learning and improving, and you know, we'll probably move into some systems where we won't be using as much herbicides. But uh, for the most part here, we're uh, planting soybeans in the rye, and then we come back and terminate it. Um, 
And this shows some of the differences. The rye that was sprayed early, this was rye that was sprayed later. And we still had the soybeans on the right, average 72 bushels on about 1,200 acres, a 72 bushel average. Was it as good on both sides, about the same on both sides? Yeah, really. It didn't make, make a lot of difference, you know. And that was, um, we got rained out and um, we just learned that we could plant uh, soybeans into that tall rye up there and uh, we had, had really good crops and so that, that worked out good. Planting corn here a year ago, uh, planting corn into uh, green rye, which is, you know, a candy, a bit of a challenge. That's what it looked like about you know a month later. Got good stands. We plant in green rye. We get a field like that that averages about 250 bushels an acre. You know, so the point is the system can work. It can work for me. It can work for any other farmer. But we got to kind of learn learn how to do this, and we're kind of doing it. If I had one picture, probably if I was given one picture to show, it'd be this one here. This was actually pulled off of the. Um, uh, bird's eye view of Bing's map, it's kind of what I call a third party slide. Yeah, here we go. And so you can see on the north side of the road here, you see this green, of course, that is cereal rye. We have the contour terraces here. We got another farm that we farm here, green, green. Here's a farm that's sometimes no till, sometimes not, and then we have a tillage farm. So you really have three different management systems. I just happened to catch on the slide, I was going through and looking at one, and this happens to be about two and a half miles west of Wellman. And so you can see the difference between the top and the bottom, and here there's three different management systems. You see the erosion here just on the bean ground. And you, when you look here closely, you just don't see much of that going on. But here, over here, there's another farm, that actually be another, sometimes no-till. <coughs> and even in the no-till, we get this kind of erosion. Now this one here, it does get quite a bit of tillage and you can't even cross that ditch. And so you go from this to this to this. And so after I started seeing that, there's something going on there. Yeah, we got cover crops there, you know, it might stop, but there's something going on when we move, when we start no-tilling, cover cropping, there's something changing in that microbial process where you've got more stable soils, they're more resilient, they can, they can stand some of these rainfalls where we can't here. And this is where we're getting the, you know, the nitrates, the sedimentation in our water and so forth. And so that's what we got to stop. And so we do a lot of picture taking and comparisons because I think farmers can see this. I love getting out and just kind of showing, you know, what the difference is just from, you know, just shifting your camera, you know, like 45 degrees, you know. Now this doesn't happen to be across the road, but it's within about the same section. And so you can definitely see a difference with cover crop rye. And there's been so many different rains. I would think this was about the six, one of the six inch rains we had last year. We've had a lot of heavy rainfalls. You've had them, I've had them now. They're, they're uh, more persistent. So basically, you know, there's a lot of things I don't understand about the science, but I can see one thing and that's what I can see, you know. I know we can stop the erosion. So that's the one thing that keeps me going. When you start talking about the science and I can't see it, sometimes it gets a little harder. But I can see this, that's pretty. You know, that's coming right down past Colon and English River. That's coming off the South Fork of the South English for that. It's coming out of there. And of course, you know, as you go into no-till cover crops, you build soil quality. I'm not sure I can explain it, but you can sure see soil health when you're looking at it here. And so, a little bit about the microbial system. When, when you stop tilling the soil and you start growing, having a living root in there of any kind of a cover crop, you start to have Different things happen with the fungal hypha. You get mycorrhiza fungi, our muscular mycorrhiza fungi. You've changed the, the environment below. You're not tilling the soil anymore. And so this fungi kind of forms a symbiotic relationship where it's feeding off of the root of a you know, corn plant or a bean plant or any living plant. And they're both living off each other and they're kind of regulating the flow of nitrogen and phosphorus back and forth through the hyphae. And when that hyphae dies in senesce, it leaves a substance called glomalin, glomalin. And it's kind of a sticky protein that actually is the glue that holds the soil together. And so, you know, we start the no-till, the cover crops, then we start to get that mycorrhiza fungi. And you don't get as much of it when you start tilling. And when you start tilling, it tends to go away, and so you don't get that, uh, that resilient soil. And so the hyphae can extend up to 100 times the length of a root. And they've done this, they've shown demonstrations of, uh, of mycorrhiza fungi growing hundreds and hundreds of feet within uh, forested areas. And uh, they can show how you can feed a tree several hundred feet away, you know, through this hyphae. And so 
what I like, if, my thinking is here, if I stop tilling the soil, I stop breaking these, these hyphae up. And the, these are feeding the corn plant, and when they die, they form this little <coughs> mailer. And this was only discovered back in the 1990s through, a, through the electron microscope. Sarah Wright and uh, Christine Nichols were actually ones that discovered this. I didn't have any of this when I was in school when I was going through. This kind of shows a, a typical what maybe a tillage field would look like. You don't have this mycorrhiza fungi here. And so, to me, there is maybe an opportunity to increase crop yields. I really, because we're actually increasing our root system. Now, they haven't really proven that, but they show through veg vegetables and so forth. I think um, Wendy Tahari, if you get on YouTube and look up Wendy Tahari, she has a really nice presentation on the mycorrhiza fungi who shows about a 27% increase in yields like in vegetable crops. And so I suspect we might be getting some of this going on in our corn and soybeans. And sure enough, back in 2008, Successful Farming, uh, Dave Mouse wrote an article interviewing a Nebraska researcher. Maybe you know him, Francis, I don't know. But they're basically talking about if you've no-tilled forever, and if, let's say you just want to plow one time, is that okay? You've no-tilled, I just want to break up you know, some type of hard pan or level it off, is that okay? Well, the article said, yeah, basically, it's, you're not going to hurt your soil just tilling it one time. You know? But it says in this little paragraph buried right in the middle of the article, back in 2008, up here it says, mycorrhizae, which colonized roots and are valuable in water and nutrient uptake and not recovered to no-till levels three years after tillage. So you start tilling that and your mycorrhizae go away. I didn't even know what mycorrhiza fungi was, you know, but as we started to read this, and sure enough, you know, almost 10 years ago in the Successful Farming Magazine, so, you know, there is something to this, and we're learning, so why that one slide I showed you, why was these fields to the south eroding and the ones on top with cover crops not? Well, I think it's the sticky protein in the glomail and making that more resistant. So, through a series of pictures that we go through, I can kind of show the differences, and just kind of going back and forth, and and just showing you um, soils that are in shape and soils that aren't in shape. You know, if you go to the gym, some of us are in shape and some of us aren't in shape. Well, it's kind of the same way in soils. You know, there are some soils that can take a six inch rain and there are some soils that can't. And this is a picture back in 2012 on a Sunday about 11.30 after about a three inch rain, which is a pretty big rain, uh, coming off of a rye cover crop. That's pretty clear water. That's really... We don't like city water leave, but you know, we are not going to be able to hold all of that. So that's pretty clear water after three inch rain. Same rain down the road about five miles. We had this going on. I didn't have a gauge out, and I can't prove that, but I imagine if we go back and look, it was about the same type of rainfall. And so you're seeing the erosion here where the water's not even making it down the center of the waterway like it's supposed to. This field's planted. And so we get this kind of erosion, and just five miles away, I would call it the same rain, you get this. And so you start to go back and forth. Now we get into some C and D slopes. This here is actually at my front door, just west of Wellman. We're um, in what I would call from A, B, C, and D slopes. Cover crop, three inch rain. You look really close, there's not a whole lot moving there. Across the road. There is, you know, feel like here. See right here where we were, not over here we get that kind of erosion. This is a six inch rain. Can't remember if it, I think it's 2013. The river's going to come out here to a record level and come right through Kelowna. You see the terraces are filled up, but if you look really closely, that rise is really not that impressive of a height. But look at that, there's not much erosion going on. You just after a six inch rain. This is out on the prairie south of uh, Wellman, between Wellman and Washington, and even on our flatter soils, they load up on the water, we get the erosion. This is a six inch rain now on the C and D slope. We get just a little bit going on here. So that's, we get that type of erosion, but if you look here, well, that's pretty stable. On that steep of a farm, you know, that you know, kind of erosion. This is south of Williamsburg over about uh, nine years ago. This field's been planted. You see the seeds here, and you can actually see the, where the field cultivator, the tillage pass, was made before, right down to the plow there. Everything that that tillage implement loosened just washed away. And so up here, you can even see a kind of a blondish area of the erosion over time. You know, that used to have been darker organic matter through the erosion, and so we just uh, we've taken all that soil out in that event. <coughs> so as we kind of go back and forth, 
can you just see the differences? This is actually when back in 1983. This was some of the first cover crop. This is Dick Stoutner's farm there south of between Walman and Kyoto. Uh, some of the first cover crop. Dick's farm, I was crop scouting that when I worked for the Kyoto Co-op. And so you can see right across the fence and it conventionally tilled all, all the erosion going on, you know, so on. So you can just go back. Okay, not a, not an impressive rain. This was just an inch and a half. You know, just think about it, inch and a half being a small rain. You know. Just down the road, though, same rain, and you can see what's going on. Same rain, just different management systems. And there's actually an east slope right back here. So actually, you know, we go from the steep hills down the river bottom. You got a neighbor at Tills. You can see how that water's uh, ponding there in the anhydrous tracks. You know, or the tillage, the water's not soaking away. Here, this is the cover crop, there's not much going on. So you can, as you go back and forth, you can see the differences in um, what we see going on between the, the, the road crops and the no-till and the cover crops. This is a six inch ring we had last year, yeah, that was. And so, some people talk about the vertical till equipment, which basically means they're just gonna take and lightly tickle it till that top quarter inch of soil. They're thinking that's a no-till equipment. And I know this field up here is was vertically tilled. And if you look really close, this is pretty clear water until you see this brown stream, brown color in that stream. And that's coming from off that vertical tilled field. So anytime you touch the soil, you loosen the soil, you're going to make it, um, give it the opportunity to erode away. We talk about infiltration when we get these heavy rains. This is actually a no-till field, or I'd say sometimes no-till. It gets maybe just a few times. If I just turn 180 degrees, I didn't even move. I just 180 degrees in a no-till cover crop. Everything's soaking away. See the rivers coming up down there, you know. So this is a tillage field where that water is sealed up tight. It's The water's not getting away as fast. When it doesn't get away, it's going to move sideways. It's going to block get into a no-till situation, long-term cover crop, it goes down. And so, this is another picture, just keep this in mind. We, we do have a lot of hogs in the farm. We have about 15,000 of hogs, and so we have a lot of swine manure to get rid of. And actually, we're just experimenting here with drilling rye immediately behind the, um, uh, the manure spreader. And I think what impresses me most here, we're at a nursery rate, uh, this is coming from a nursery where we're putting on about 6,000 gallons to the acre of manure, how fast we can be right behind that manure spreader. That is, that is um, getting away that quickly. So that's really kind of a story on infiltration. You know. Now, if we were in a long-term tilt situation, that would not, uh, would not be the, the situation there. So. so you can just kind of go back, whoops, go back and forth. See the different things. Well, I was going to show you here. This was one year ago, and uh, this is about a year ago, a little over a year ago, a year ago in a week. And um, we got this planted the corn into a rye cover crop. You can see the manure track, spring applied manure, which used to be a no no in the spring. And then here we get this really big rain, and it six inches fills everything up, and it's cold. You know, that's hardly the recipe for a good corn crop. Well, this is what this field looked like. Um, with the drone picture the following, you know, in July, right before Tacitus, from here to here. And so that's a pretty solid field of corn. That was a 170 acre field of corn that averaged 261 bushels dried across the scales. 261. And that, for those that understand the corn suitability ratings, that is about a, um, a 70 CSR farm, where the average Washington County tillable will be in the 80s now. So I mean, so we're not talking the best ground in the state, in the county, but it but it averaged for crop insurance reason it was 261 across the scale. So we went from here. So what I've learned is, you know, the, the no-till is in the cover crops can really take a lot. It is really resilient. And I think if we go through some hot, dry summers, I think we're going to hang in there pretty good too. So as we go through Farmers want to talk about yields. I'm usually talking to farmer groups, and sure enough, if I, you know, after church or after a farm bureau meeting, or um, if I'm at a um, machinery show, I'll have a farmer come up to me, and he's going to come and get right in my face and say, you know, I did exactly what you said. So I planted my cereal rye, and right to the line, I lost 40 bushels an acre 
where I planted corn into cereal rye, that's why I don't plant cover crops. You know? And we hear a lot of that, you know, so it's not a simple thing. And so, and he was telling the truth, he probably had some train wrecks. Was, I wouldn't say it's that easy. And sure enough, if you look at the data, this was put together by, this was actually off of the Pioneer, DuPont Pioneer website, and it's comparing corn and soybean yield response following cereal rye over a four year period. Uh, by field, this was put together by Sarah Carlson with PFI, Practical Farmers of Iowa. Very good data. I think Rob Stout actually is a bar in here. Uh, Rob's also a farmer of Westchester. And it basically shows you in the corn, uh, we're going to look at corn and, and soybeans. Sure enough, we do show uh, a yield reduction following uh, a rye in a lot of cases here. And that's not good. And that's what these farmers are talking about. And I've heard you know, much larger yield reduction and we, that's why you don't get the adoption. You know. If we look at soybeans, not near as much. Well, you know, corn we have quite a bit, but we also have some winners here. We also see some increase in yield when we follow rye. But it looks like in soybeans, the green, a lot more green area than there is uh, in soybeans and corn, a lot more red, the yield reduction. And so you kind of look at that, why, why the difference? You know, why does corn have more problems than soybeans? Well, maybe nitrogen is an issue. Um, corn, we have to have a perfect stand. That means we have to have every seed come up to get a yield. Soybeans, you know, we can lose up to half our plants and still have a, you know, 100% yield, you know. And so maybe it has something to do with the getting stand. And so we look at some of our corn yields in the last you know, seven, eight years. Uh, I got 2016 in there. We averaged last year 254 on our farm all the way from corner to corner. These are numbers that we turned into my insurance agent in Washington, Don Vitito. We are 254 in corn. Down a little bit in at soybeans 67 a year ago. We were 72. We dropped a little bit. Probably some sudden death issues in the beans. Uh, but uh, 245 on corn uh, two years ago to where our our average is uh, ahead of the county by about 25% on beans, about 12 to 13%. And so, where our soil types, I would not say we're in the best part of the county with you know lesser soils, you know, we can still do pretty good on yields. And so this is what we're trying to show. You know, if we can get farmers to find ways to increase their yields, you know, and cover crops, you know. And so this gets down in the weeds a little bit, you know, but when I talked to farmers, I said, okay, so the guy came up to me after church and said, look, I lost 40 bushels. I'm never going to do this again. You know, and you hear it all the time. And so I'm thinking, well, he's right. But I said, gosh, it's working for us. And I said, okay, well, let's kind of, let's, let's figure this out, you know. And so I basically, when we go to farm meetings, I say, well, we've got, it's, it's a nitrogen issue with corn specifically. Corn planter settings, you know, what Jim was teaching us how to do, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we got to get that corn planter adjusted to plant into more residue. Certainly insects play a role. Army worms, we get, we got a lot of army worms in the county right now. Right now, I've got fields that need to be sprayed because, you know, when you grow a cover crop, they will attract insects. Not a big deal, but you can stand to lose maybe a little bit of yield from insects. And that time thing, and um, it, when we start to no-till and cover crop, you know, it just doesn't happen overnight. You know, it takes a little while to get that system going. So I definitely think there is a, there is a time factor in there. And so basically I'm saying, you know, you could take those 40 bushels or 25 bushels and probably assign them a number in there. You know, and so when we go to fields, uh, field days, we talk about the residue cover here. As you get more residue on your soils, <laughs> The microbes fire up and they start to take that and decompose that carbon. And when they do that, they need nitrogen. And so the, the more residue on there, they're going to take nitrogen and they're going to steal it basically from the corn. Right? This is kind of an example. This is basically a flood, a flood zone, and this is the beach area where it dropped all the residue. I mean, it doesn't, you can't really see it here too close, but there's about six inches more residue here than there is here. And so when those microbes see all that residue, it's kind of like whipped cream. They just go nuts and they fire up and they're going to start to decompose that. But when they do that, it's, they need nitrogen to make that process work. And that's where we get in and talk about carbon-nitrogen ratios. This corn here looks really, uh, really good up here because you didn't have all that residue dropped in by the flood. This is kind of a simulated carbon. But the idea is when we start to no-till cover crop, 
we got to learn to manage our nitrogen a little bit differently. This is a what I would call a typical, just a no-till corn planted into soybean soil. Not cover crop or anything, just no-till. And that looks, what I would say, just barely adequate. We get kind of a, what you would think of a yellow, crappy no-till field, and that's why I don't do it. You know, and so that corn, the green tall corn, is getting nitrogen. That yellow short corn has not found the nitrogen yet for the nitrogen track. And so that field's suffering. That's why farmers don't no-till. That, or one one reason. That's why. I there again, I turn 180 degrees and look at a field. It's really nice and even stand, good stand. You got a good solid color to it. That I didn't move one bit. I just turned the camera angle. Uh, this here's a no-till cover crop field, and that's been no-till probably 25, 25 some years. And so there is a difference. In, and so when I talk about nitrogen, how we handle our nitrogen, I don't. Um, I talk in terms of maybe spoon feeding our nitrogen. When I, you know, this kind of gets in the weeds for you guys. But when I talk to farmers, you know, we start nitrogen application early in the fall with some ammonium sulfate. Uh, we have some turkey manure. We got swine manure, some ammonium sulfate again in this uh, spring, and when we come back with uh, some spring manure. Maybe sometimes a weed feed. I've got nitrogen on my planter, and then we side this now. I'm not putting on 500 pounds of nitrogen here. You, know, you can only maybe put on 100 pounds, but we're putting it on early in the system, kind of starting in the fall, going around to when we plant corn in the spring and side dress. We start early to add some nitrogen, so those microbes have some nitrogen. We're, we're feeding the microbial process so they can decompose that carbon so they don't compete with the corn. That's what we're doing. We've got to get that started early. Maybe get 30 pounds out there. Maybe I could do that with swine manure or substitute. So I don't do these to every field every year. I pick maybe one or two of these. And we're in a learning process now, you know, uh, trying to figure out, well, which one is more important. You know, more spring application, more fall application. Um, how much with the planter, you know. We're starting to, sh we, we are shifting. And we're kind of on go. We've got plots in our fields now that we uh, were testing. We've got one farm that we're going to do about $10,000 worth of soil tests. Just look at the nitrates week by week to see where they're at, you know, and maybe, you know, where, where can we cut our nitrogen back, you know. And so we see fields, um, this year was into a no-till cover crop. Yeah, I like the stand. Look at that. I like that perfect stand. This was planted in the cover crop. This here happens to be a drone picture. This was a cover crop field. You see a nice even field. This was a cover crop field here with a farmer just learning how to do it. He's short of nitrogen. This field flashed early last year. This farm is really suffering because of it doesn't have enough nitrogen and that was a cover crop field and do you think he's going to do it again or not? This was the field here that averaged 261 over the scales. This has been cover crop. This was a cover crop that wasn't quite as good. It was a 256 average. Look at the CSRs on that. CSR 2, a 61.3 with a 256 average. That's, you know, so we can raise some pretty good yields off of these hills. And again, these are all dry yields, the way to cross the scale, turn it into the insurance. And so basically, we're just showing two different management systems. And this one here just needs to change how they manage your nitrogen a little bit. Not much more. So we talk about nitrogen, that's a big issue. It's a complicated one. Like Francis said, you've seen all the arrows go in all different directions, you know, and it is a leaky, it is a very leaky system. And then we get to the more fun things we talk about. Farmers love iron, they love to talk about machinery. We, the second thing is the planter, you know, and so we could go through and talk about, you know, hours on just how we set our planters up and how we can manage the residue with the row cleaner. Um, each row is managed by a satellite, so that a satellite knows where every row is as it moves through the field. And so if you're planning on a contour and you're going, the outside row is going farther than the inside row, that satellite knows exactly where row 1 through 24 or 1 through 16 is, and it's dropping a seed individually. And so you can bring that up and you can actually watch it live. I can sit at home and watch the hired man plant corn. You can see the speed, you can see the population, you can see how much down pressure is being applied a uh, sub-inch. And so the satellite's picking up uh, five times per second on how much down pressure to apply 
to keep that unit in the ground. So these are very sophisticated systems and we can do a very good job, you know, planting corn, you know, today and, and soybeans. And so there is quite a bit going on in these on these corn planters. And it's really a lot of fun, you know, to, to see how we can fine tune fine tune. And this is actually going through the field. We got a row cleaner here that we're trying to move that residue over a little bit so we kind of leave us but we're not we're moving the residue, not the soil, and so we're trying to leave a a, you know, six to eight inch space so this corn can warm up a little quickly. A little quicker, we have spike closing wheels which kind of works to the ground to kind of get it dried out. And then we're adding some nitrogen. You actually see some nitrogen coming out there on the surface. On um, that, that's 32% nitrogen. Another shot, just planted into green rye a couple years ago, going through the field. There again, it's kind of interesting. I mean, that. The satellites tracks each individual row. It knows exactly how far. And so when we come to the, when we come to, when it's time to turn, that seed meter knows exactly when to shut off right to the row. So it shuts off. And so um, we can do a very good job, you know, planting the field to basic from from the engineering that's going on. So just a picture of um, doing our uh, cover crop in the spring, planting it. This was that. 272 average in our corn plot this year. This is in one field that we took a picture. See how each one of those are just spaced perfectly, exactly where it's supposed to be. It's basically it comes down to ear count pounds of corn leaving the field. You know that's what we need to see, and that was planted into green rye. You know, so it, the system does work, but it takes a little bit to get to it. You know, and so we can actually see a comparison with my planter compared to a plot that we put in. We had a one-acre plot, had a university come in and do a one-acre plot with the plot planter. You know, it was supposedly set up for no-till. This is my planter. This is what the plot planter left. And you see just the gaps. You know, remember those bar charts where you were seeing yield loss? Well, this is one example where you're getting yield loss. This is a corn planter that left probably 60 bushels an acre in the, when they left the field that day planting it. They were 60 bushels an acre behind. You can see maybe a difference if you kind of see left to right. Does the left look a little darker, greener than the right? You know, that's my planter here. This here's the, the no-till planter. So we're really comparing two different planters. One set up for no-till and one not. And so there, there was about 260 to 190s, about a 70 bushel difference, I believe. Just in the just just in a corn plant. Everything was the same. And we don't have that opportunity very often to, to compare planters, but we did there. So nitrogen, get your planter taken care of. I also mentioned insects. When you have six foot tall rye growing, that loves, that attracts a lot of the insects, army worms, cut worms. Um, with all our manures that we have, we get a lot of seed attacking insects. So we tend to maybe have a little bit more in, insect pressure um, I would say just be ready to treat, you know, we kind of use our, um, we don't have to treat with insecticide, but just be ready to because army worms can come in and work a pretty good uh, damage over just on a weekend. And so the final thing is the time factor. And so it's really hard to talk about, you know, well, how can time improve corn yields? Or, and so we're basically talking soil structure changes and and so one way I thought maybe I could do that is this is um, two and a half acre grids from soil samples showing organic matter in the field. And so when we do our fertility soil sampling, we'll also throw in an organic matter uh, level. And so this is a pretty typical southern Iowa drip plain soil here in Washington County, lust soils. You know, our organic matters, you know, from the sand, sandier areas down to one nine to uh, maybe up to three and a half, you know, at the base of the hill. This is up on the top of a hill going down, and you get your, your higher organic matters. This is from an old farmstead that had been there for 50 years, and it's still showing, you know, 4 7. But if you look all the way over to the right, where this guy, he, I had pulled a um, soil sample out of the fence line. Look what he was pulling out of the fence line. Basically, soils that had never been tilled before. And I have pulled some 7% organic matter, and you being a soil scientist would know that's our native level of organic matter. You know, when the pioneers come to Iowa, you know, 150, 200 years ago, this is what they were seeing, and you wouldn't need nitrogen to, to, to plant corn back in those days. And so basically, when you hear someone make the comment that we've lost 
half our soil resources in the state of Iowa, well, we really have because uh, what I'm seeing in the field is about half of what's in the fence row. And we've lost that through soil oxidation by just tilling the soil, introducing oxygen into the soil, pulling out a carbon and CO2, and then just from sedimentation and erosion. You know. So we've lost you know, half our soil resources. So that's something that uh, we want to watch. Uh, so these are some soil slides, just some, some microscopic slides taken, and they're basically showing a long-term no-till cover crop field in Washington County compared to one in Washington County that's just always been tilled. And you're basically seeing more pore space here. Uh, this was taken uh, by Jason Steele, who's a soil scientist at Fairfield. Jason took these pictures and compared the two sediment to uh, the NRCS lab. Kathy Woida was the um, state geologist, took these pictures. and. Just basically showing you what you get um, over a longer period of time and why I have more infiltration um, in, in our fields. Um, here there's no structure at all. There's really no pore space. There's not a lot of biology going on there. This would be kind of the book value if you look up in the soil science book. We just have a lot more oxygen, a lot more spaces for water. And so the size of the pore spaces are, play a key role in improved ridding you know, oxygen. And so the point is, you know, it, that just didn't happen overnight. That's going to take a little bit to, to happen. If you want to go some <clears throat> documentation, you can maybe look to Ohio State University. Uh, Jim Norman would say, if you no-till, it might take seven to eight years to get your soils in shape to no-till them. But if we had cover crops, we can do that much quicker. You know, we can start getting our soil aggregate structures together in two to three years, you know, maybe make that look good. So when we go on, on trips and you're looking out the car, you go down the interstate and you see a desk and then you see a sheep's foot out there, they're basically, they're road building, you know, we're building, building roads and so when you build a road you want to break down that soil structure and so you, you take that pore space out and take that air out you're going to disc it up and then you're going to pack it. And you disc it up and you're going to pack it. And that's how you build a good hard road. That's a good thing if you're building roads. But if you're a farmer and you're discing your fields and you come back with a combine, you disc it and come back with a manure spreader, a grain cart, you know, when you till and you pack, you till and you pack, you're basically making roads in your fields. So you're destroying. A disc is a horrible, horrible piece of equipment, <laughs> you know, for soil structure. You know, that just, it's probably one of the worst ones. So that's awfully hard to show. This is probably a picture, Jim, you took back in 1978 or 9 of a furrow behind a corn planter. This is corn planted into this, and that's not a desirable slot for a corn seed, is it? If you want to grow perfect corn, that's not the way to do that. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for that. that could, one could be maybe the way the planter was set up. Two, it could have been too darn wet the day he planted it. <clears throat> but I also see just after I've seen it, I'm sure Francis, there's just a whole lot of difference in comparing, and today after something that's been no-tilled forever, in cover crop, there's actually see some right cover crop in there. You see a whole lot of different soil structure, you know. And so this is, this needs to take some time and um, that soil will improve. And that maybe I'm trying to show that, does that happen? And then there's a picture of this what's like, you know, uh, cover um, planting into cover crop. Got that seed tucked in there. That's just almost like flower pot soil. That's really what we wanted. So that's where we're at, and um, I think this will be a good time to end. And um, it, it's a learning process. And then we, you know, we started out, you know, doing this many years ago, and we never knew where we'd end up. And we're probably only a 10% of the way there. And we've got a lot of changes to make in our farm. Um, so a lot of the nitrogen that is applied to the farm, they said, well, we're, so what, what's coming out of your tile lines? And so this is a really a complicated, complicated chart for this late at night, but I think we've got to show it. And um, I don't know if we get some light on. And it's, it's basically showing the relationship between tile nitrate water. These points here are taken all over the state of Iowa, Pete Lollard, Iowa State. This is the curve that he's put in. Comparing the soil nitrates to the amount of nitrogen put on in the soil that the, the actual pounds per acre farmers apply. And so it would stand the reason as you apply more nitrogen, there's going to be more nitrates come out of the tile, which kind of stands the reason. You know? And so these are pounds per acre of nitrogen. 
These are parts per million. So like the drinking water standard, 10 parts per million. And so we get a curve in there. And so now these blue lines are actual tile lines that we have been testing and we've sampled more more through the Iowa Soybean Association for the last several years and we can see now they're not just static straight lines that these are actually going up and down throughout the year these are just averages you know I mean you know and, and so they're not going to be just glued on one number but this is the average of this tile line this is the average of this tile line and so we do indeed have on our farm we do have some that are above 10 parts per million you know and so and that that would be like to get get these numbers down. You look at this here blue line and when I get the numbers in the mail after we test those tile and I look at the numbers I can almost tell you exactly where that was taken, which tile line. Do you remember the picture where I was putting on the 6,000 gallons of manure with the manure spreader? That was exactly right on top of that tile line. And so this tile line gets the same management as this tile line, as this one, as this one, as this one. And so we're not exactly sure why, why the difference is, you know, and, but, um, but the important thing is that we're testing, we're testing all the time, and, um, and so we can make improvement to indeed get these down, because that's basically the whole point of the program, is how can we get the nitrates, you know, out of our uh, rivers and streams. And um, if you look all the way over to the right-hand side, the green area would be in the range where we are applying the amount of uh, nitrogen um, that would be put on our corn. And so the average nitrates that we're pulling is about a 13. We're getting about 13 parts per million average coming out of our tile lines at this rate of nitrogen. Well, if you would look, you know, if you were putting on this much nitrogen without cover crops, you know, you'd be much higher. So basically what we're seeing in this gap here is what's being taken up by the cereal rye, and so that rye is um, taking, you know, taking up some of that um, nitrogen and keeping it out of the system. But like Francis said, you know, you know, rye is not the total savior. Cover crops aren't the total savior. You know, it's only going to improve the situation about 30 percent. You know, and so there are many, many factors that we got to look at to, you know, improve. And but this is just one, basically showing that we are seeing differences. You know, we are seeing a reduction of. Um, nitrates come out of the tile basically by the uptake of, of the cover crop and so um, so we are testing and I would say that um, that would be a good place for uh, farmers to you know just you know take a cup and a glass and just start you know sticking them on your tile lines right down you know start keeping track of what's coming out of your your tile systems and I should say on this here some of those lines are on all our farms some of those are neighboring farms you know maybe now this I know this one here is on our, our farm all the way, but you know some of these are running up into neighbor farms, you know, and so under different management systems, and so you know there's a lot of stuff that can be, you know, um, can be improved on there. So, but um, anyway, I think it's important that we're testing. Um, basically, my key thing when I talk to farmers is, you know, the the, it, the system does work. I mean, it can work, and I also think there is a niche to improved yields basically by expanding our root systems, you know, through the mycorrhizal fungi, and that's just one of many, many things, you know, the, the earthworms and, and all the other benefits that we get, and, um, and uh, it, it's an exciting, it's a challenging thing. I'm not a scientist, so I don't really understand a lot of what goes on, but I can sure see it, you know, from not seeing the erosion. Um, sticking a spade in a soil and what was it 25 to 30 earthworms per spade dig you know and it's really easy and you can actually see I'm sure you can see rootworms or not rootworm but earthworm channels that were put in who knows maybe 10 15 years ago you know as long as you don't till the soil you know you're not moving any of these um, you know, channels around so um, it just you know. have you cracked your organic matter percent change at all well, the question is, have we tracked our organic matter percent change? And yes, and what I'm, what I'm seeing there is I just see a lot of up and down. If you had to pin me down to a number on organic matter, remember I showed you, we talked a little bit earlier about the organic matter levels, which run as a percent by weight, like uh, 
what a, a foot of soil over an acre would be about two million pounds, and so this would be a percent. This would be three uh, three point three percent by weight, and so we are with the manure that we use and the cover crops and um, two kinds of manure and cover crops and no tillage, maybe about a tenth of a percent a year. Of, um, and that might be generous, maybe just a little bit of a tenth of a percent. But you know, it's really hard to build organic manure. And I, I get really nervous when farmers, you know, try to, when they start talking about, well, we increased organic matter one or two percent. You know, that's, that's a pretty, that's a really big number, you know, two million pounds, you know, and to increase it. And so it, it's a slow process. And, um, you know, we really got started just by wanting to stop the loss, you know, just by stopping the, and, um, the one culprit is is the soybean. We're, I, I failed to mention we're in, a, in a, a standard corn and soybean rotation, which is pretty common. You know, 50% corn, 50% bean corn, bean corn, bean. The bean is the kind of the tough crop because of the tap root. It doesn't have as much uh, uh, rooting. It doesn't have as much residue, and so the 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 bean is a tough one. Now, the right answer to build organic. I mean, if you really want to build organic matter, is you um, get in a rotation. Start, you know, get into uh, more pastures, um, uh, vary your you know, corn and soybean rotation, break that up, uh, start uh, growing more cover crops, different diverse cover crops. Well, remember, I'm just doing one cover crop, you know, we're trying a couple others, you know, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of things we could do to improve. And, um, and so, and just, uh, I think just to measure the organic matter, I mean, just how you probe the soil, who probes it, where they probe, how deep they probe. You know, if you stick that probe in another inch deep, that could throw your whole yeah. number off. And so I, in, and I've you know, like Tom Casper, you know, soil scientist at, you know, Iowa State, you know, I could, we could probe, you know, for me to jury back there 50 times, and we would have numbers all over the you know, and so I think just the study of organic matter itself is pretty hard to, to know. I just hope we've stopped the loss. Now, what really surprised me, after we've been no-tilling, you know, 20-some years, I was at a no-till conference and learned that in a long-term cupboard, in a long-term just no-till situation, we were actually still losing organic matter in a no-till situation because of the bean year, which you would know. A lot of farmers don't even like to grow beans, you know, and so... Um, you know, if we could break that up, and so that's what really, that's what really, really pushed us. And we just left and went home and decided, well, we've got to get, this, we got to get the cover crops full time everywhere, and um, more so to build organic matter, not so much for the erosion side. Of it. So when you're now you're letting your cover crops get taller, it looks like, right? Yeah, I think we're that's learning. Make a difference too, isn't it? Yeah, we're learning to grow more biomass. It's kind of like a solar collector, and so we're we're learning to. Um, let those crop uh, cover crop grow higher. I'm starting to change up the varieties I grow. Now this year, I maybe pushed a little too far. You know, I probably got a little too much biomass. So it's, when you have cover crops, it really holds the moisture in. It really does. And it's hard to get it dried out in the spring to plant. And so it causes a lot of heartache and you have too much cover, you know, and so we're trying to find the balance. But <laughs> well, what if you let it, like, you let it grow a little taller, then you're sucking that maybe that water out too, right, before planting? And then so what I'm wondering is, like, the roll down that the organic farmers are doing, and you've got a roller now. It, um, what if you did that, like, on, on all your conventional soybeans and just roll it down, you, and then you don't have to necessarily use herbicides, but you always have them available? To use them later. That's what I mean. Do you think that's going to work in a conventional oh, system? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think we can definitely. I haven't said too much about you know our, our herbicides and our nitrogen use. You know, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in cutting back. You know, I haven't cut back as much on the herbicide, but you know, from what I've seen with your rolling, you know, that biomass. And believe me, I know uh, I've got a, I got a particular field tonight. I I walked in and you know there's there's a lot of stuff there you know, that makes great cover for uh, for weed control. You know, but. But it's complicated too. We have Palmer Amaranth now in the county in four places. Uh, water hemp is a real problem, a tall water hemp. And so um, it's not just a simple answer to just completely go away from the herbicides, but I definitely think we can cut it back. But with conventional, yeah. you have that option, whereas an organic, if you don't get it right, you're going to be, you know, you yeah. got the weed. Whereas, you know, you guys could probably take a little more risk with rolling down a big crop 
because you can always come back later and hit it. Yeah. Francis, do you want to sit in the front and then people can? Well, it's a, yeah. well, because so. then we can open it up. Sure. So, so thank first you very much. Let's, thank you. Yeah, a great opportunity to ask both of these experts questions. Do you guys have things you were wondering more about from the presentations, or wanted to ask them in particular? How do you put your rye out following a corn crop? Uh, we use, well, we've done it several different ways, and we've, we've aerial applied it. And um, we've had the uh, co-op come in or the retail and add it as we spread our, uh, our phosphorus or our potash. And, you know, we've had it you know, spread on that way, surface applied. But we predominantly have used a drill. And so about, I'd say about 90, 95% of our rye is, you know, planted in the fall immediately behind the combine. You know, and so when we start harvest, you know, mid-September, it we're out there the first day, and when we end up with corn harvest the first week of November, we're still drilling rye, and with the with the Elbon rye, some of that really, really tall rye, that was planted the first week of November. It didn't come up till the spring. What week did you plant that? Well, it was too thick. <laughs> and I had it planted at about 40 pounds, and... That's all? It's still got that thick? Yeah, it's, it's way too, it's, that's way too thick, because I had way too much biomass, and so... The one thing I've learned is you know, we can cut back the amount of cover crop, but the amount, you know, pounds per acre. One, we can cut our costs. Two, when you have uh, fewer plants out there, the root systems get bigger, you know, and so you have fewer rye plants, I can have a bigger root system on there. And then it also makes it easier to plant into. And we have experienced some problems this spring where, you know, we have really narrow windows to plant. You know, I mean, we look at, you know, we sit down and watch, you know, KCRG, Kyle Mayer, and all these people, Brittany, and all these on TV, and Brittany Ritz, I guess. And, and so we're sitting there looking at the week ahead, and, um, you know, we have like three days to get this done, or maybe four days this cycle. And, and so we had a pretty tough spring this year, and the, the cover crop will hold moisture, and that can be a really good thing. But uh, so we're learning, you know, to how we can get get it dried out and get it planted. I would say, on average, that the rye cover crop hasn't delayed our planting. But this year, it, I think it it tested me a little bit because of, we had a, a lot more biomass because I'm using a new or a, a new to me different variety of rye, very aggressive growing rye. LB huh? It's Elbon. Elbon. Is it from, early too, or is it? Is it no, early? it is. A, well, it's it's a southern rye. It comes out of the Noble Foundation. Elbon Noble, spelled backwards, Elbon Noble, and so it comes out of um, Oklahoma, and um, it puts on about forty percent more growth um, over. I think Tom Casper, Iowa, at the, at the soil research lab, that has tested this over a four-year period. Iowa State. It puts on about forty percent more growth. Good livestock feed. Comes out of dormancy quicker in the spring. It's a very aggressive rye. I would not advise anybody starting out growing cover crops to plant that ahead of corn. I would not do that because I've done it for 20 some years, and boy, I sure had a heck of a spring this spring. You know, trying to get through. We actually had to pull out of the field. I've never done it, but we we pulled into a field, and I absolutely could not get through it. And my the mistake I made was. I terminated the rye too early this spring. You know, we should plant. You should plant into green. You see me planting into some green uh, rye with the corn planter, and, and we always plant green with a drill. And I was, I got scared this year with how fast that um, Elbon was growing, and I killed it for, before Easter. And what happened was, then we got a rain. We got about two inches of rain, and went down, and just made a mat, and held that moisture, and it was mm -hmm. perfect. And we can never, I mean, you think you're going to get those nice, warm, dry, windy days if you have soybean stuff, but you know how it just dries out and you're just planting away. Or if you feel cultivated field, you, away you go. But that rye is doing a great job pulling that moisture in. And believe me, that'll make all the difference in the world in a drought year, too. And so, so if you had planted it green, you'd probably be okay. Huh? If I would have planted green, it, it's easier to plant into green rye. It, the, it, the plantability is easier. Um, it, the, the leaves are more succulent, it's easier to part, it's easier to plant into it than when we senesce the rye. I think I'll probably change up my varieties a little bit. I had a corn next year. I don't know, it's so hard to tell the year's not over yet. I mean, it's a long, we got a long ways to go. 
we're getting good corn stands. Uh, we're out evaluating corn now as it's emerging, and um, corn stands look good. Beans are not emerged yet. They should be well as warm as it was today. They should be up real quick, like. But um, and so we're we're um, evaluating stands right now. Things look do look pretty good. And uh, after going through that last week in April, I think we had a half inch every morning for about four mornings. Uh, Four, uh, two inches of rain, really cold, really cold, and we come through that really good. And uh, the seed corn technology is just fabulous compared to where it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And so the, the, the emergence is good on the corn, and so that's really important for corn yields. So, yeah, question. I have two questions. Um, one, Francis, it, how, how do you measure the corn yield? Well, I've, I've only done this roll down thing for it. It's the third year I'm doing it now, so I haven't seen anything, but I've heard you can, you know, you can get some. I think it also helps some, um, if we have more rotation, you know, more crops, and so I think it helps break the cycles too a little bit if you have. Um, and most of my, what I actually, my, my cover crops that I got in early and I had the good roll down, I was in an old hay field. With some really poor soil, it was like where all the Asian rifles were rolled away, some gravity bought, and it was totally beat up. And, and so I put in um, I, some manure on it, and then I put in the cover crop in the fall, and I got really good growth. So I'm kind of using that as my soil building program to, to, to really have good fertility for my cover crop and then it really grow. And then, and then I can come back with something like soybeans and end up and get a decent yield and, and still um, be in a soil building program. And so I'm starting, to, I'm starting to see some improvement already that soil. Some places, all the eight horizons is gone completely. Yeah, you probably got some of those clay knobs. We do have a lot. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So um, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. you know. So what is your rotation versus? Well, I don't have a set rotation. I mean, I, I with my cows, I need hay, so I generally have a couple of years of alfalfa hay or something in the in the cow. But I in a, in, a, in a field, but I kind of just go by what I need. You know, what do I need to feed my cows and. Mm -hmm. How's this field doing, and what's you know? If I have a hay field that's doing a while, I'll leave it go longer. And if it's uh, if it's kind of losing itself out, but I'll come in and, and put in something else. So I don't have a set rotation. Mm -hmm. so I have one more question. Um, so if you if you uh, bring in the chemicals and you you know kill down the um, your your cover crop, does do you find that you have more um, nitrogen loss in your in the soil immediately after that because it's not being held in the roots of the plant? You're talking herbicides and nitrogen? Yeah. Well, if you kill down your, your cover crop. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, yeah, that's one of the saddest days of the year is when we have to finally kill that cover crop, you know. And so <laughs> hopefully, you know, we got the corn plant coming on right away afterwards, you know, to kind of start to take that nitrogen up. But, yeah, when that rice and essence, you know, we've stopped... Uh, Taking that nitrogen up, and I would say by the reproductive time, when, when a lot of our rye has gone to seed, you know, it's probably it's taken up its maximum amount of nitrogen, and so we need something else to come along, and that's where we got to keep a green plant growing, like uh, corn. And, and remember that now that rye crop has a lot of that nitrogen in in the tissue, and so now that you kill it, it's going to start to decompose and release that nitrogen for the next crop. And too. hopefully, slowly throughout the time throughout the summer. Oh, but, yeah, it definitely will you know, hold that nitrogen in the plant tissue. So. Yeah, and that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. What we don't know is exactly when it's going to release to the corn when it needs right. it, you know. <laughs> it's based on basically, you know, the weather, you know, the sunlight and rainfall and, and temperature, temperature and rainfall. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, if you get a hot, dry summer, you're not going to get a lot of release from that nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And also, if, if the, the cover crop is real lush and young, it'll decompose quickly. But if it gets to be tall, then it has a lot of lignin and, and cellulose things that don't decompose so readily, so it'll decompose more slowly. So that's part of the mix too. You know? Well, that's carbon. That's your carbon, carbon nitrogen ratio. Carbon right? nitrogen ratio. You're showing you the picture. Yeah, that gets pretty complicated. But uh... you know, Francis, uh, Mike Carberry, uh, Johnson County Supervisor, and Iowa City Sierra Club. Thank you both for being here. I've been working on water quality issues at the State House for maybe 12 years, and. Um, I'm about ready to pull my hair out. I mean, it's just very frustrating. You, know, uh, you guys are doing great work on your farms, but we don't have enough of you, and uh, the Farm Bureau uh, continues to, you know, deny that we have a water quality problem in the state, and uh, nothing happens up at the state house 
unless the Farm Bureau kind of signs off on it. I learned that f uh, five years being a full-time <laughs> lobbyist, who, who the power in the state is. Um, I really like your idea of the water quality plan, just like we have a soil management plan and maybe uh, you know some uh, confinements have manure management plans. About five years ago, Craig Lang told me that what we really need to do, he says that carrot isn't working, or the carrots, we don't, can't afford enough carrots, you know, voluntary, because we can't afford the money to basically pay these farmers to do conservation. And nobody wants the stick, you know, the regulations. So he, he says, you tie the carrot to the stick. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you don't, if you want farm programs like insurance or anything federal, that, then you would have to do certain uh, conservation measures like you showed in your slides, you know, the, the no-till, the cover crop, the grass waterways, the bioreactors, uh, the riparian buffers. You would say, say there's five things right there, you've got to do three or four of them to get uh, crop insurance. Well, better than the, the yeah. saying how many, it's better is to say that you need to meet a goal. Yeah. And then you can do whatever you need to do to meet the goal. So, yeah. um, what would be your advice on, uh, you know, we had three really bad bills up there this last year and they all failed and I was very happy that they <laughs> went away because there wasn't enough money in it. The money came from the wrong places. It stole from Peter to s steal from Paul. Yeah. What, if you were, uh, had a magic wand mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and could wave it, and what would you do? How would you, uh, you know, well, as a legislative a, fix? Ideally, it should be at the federal level because then uh, there's water quality problems in every state in this country. Yes. And, and just like soil conservation plans, it's nationwide, and it can be tied to um, farm payment programs. Right. And so it, ideally, it should be done at the federal level. Whether that it should have to be, it could be done at the state level, though. We already have, like you said, manure management plans. And I think the first step would be, if, We've been every year allocating, you know, $10 million or something for water quality projects, and we've been doing that for 30 years, and, and, the, and we often just tally how our success is by how much money we spend, but we don't really see a lot of progress. And so uh, if you could take the next increment of $5 million or something and, and have some researchers put together this water quality model that would, would you know, spit out a water quality plan on the farm, then we, you could either require one or else you could have the incentives. People um, who, who, you know, People who do the water quality plan get the cost share money. Then they have a whole farm plan that's going to meet the goal. Or some other people, you know, get century farm awards or whatever, you know, something to give somebody some some good feelings for doing something right. I think it could catch on, is that the neighbors, you know, will start to look across at another neighbor and think, you know, this guy's not doing it right. So, so I don't know. I don't know what it would take. So Larry Weber at the Flood Center told me, and we've been working with him for a number of years, I said, okay, we know we need to work on a watershed level, right? And he said, yes. And I said, how big of a watershed? And I think he said, up 12. And well, I said, you say every, every piece of land is in a watershed. Correct. So a very small watershed is uh, there's, there's a up 12. And I said, how many of those are in the state? He said, 1,600. And I said, how much for water quality and quantity in each up 12? He said, 3 million each. And I said, okay, that's $6 million for each Huck 12 watershed times 1,600, that's $9.6 billion. Mm -hmm. And so this three-eighths of a cent they were trying to pass yeah. essentially gives water quality $100 million a year. It would take 96 years of that funding to get to that $9.6 billion. So that's the proverbial drop in the bucket. And of course, the sales tax is paid mostly by urban folks. And as you showed on your slide, uh, 90 per, 93 percent of the N and 80 percent of the P is coming from agricultural processes. But sales taxes are paid almost exclusively by urban folks because uh, most farm inputs are not uh, not taxed. So the the polluter does not pay. So that's not an elegant solution either. So uh, I'm looking. I like to. I like your ideas. <laughs> I just don't. And the federal, but we, they would have to be in the farm program yeah, every farm five program. years and. I was told that the rice and cotton farmers don't like that those ideas. So well, there are going to be people, people who don't like anything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Steve, yes. you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, I think you need to get the landlord involved. Definitely be working um, the owner of the, of the property. Well, and half the land is, is rented now, isn't it? Sixty yeah. sixty percent. And I'll go to give presentations like at the Iowa City Rotary Club, and when you're done, you know, there'll be 15 
doctors and lawyers all lined up, you know, what can I do to get my, you know, my tenant to do that. And, um, and so I think we definitely need to get them involved. I think, I think of the pluses and minuses. I think, I think the watersheds are a very good thing. You know, we're, I'm on, on the, the English River watershed board. And, um, you know, sometimes we talk about hypoxia. That's a long ways away, and that's not our problem. But, you know, everyone, there's a watershed, there's a watershed coming off this roof, you know. I mean, there's just, and so when we go uh, boating or we're water skiing up at the Coralville uh, lakes up there, you know, we kind of think about what we're swimming in, you know, we kind of, it gets closer to home. So I think the watersheds are, I think, really important because I think we can work on an individual uh, projects. You know, this state's a really big state, and I mean, being a soil scientist is just how diverse the geography is in Iowa. And so what I talked about here today is going to have to be somewhat changed if I go into a northern latitude like in, a, in, a, in the Wisconsin lobe in a higher clay soil versus if you're in you know, northeast Iowa, you know, in a driftless area, the different types of soils, it, it gets cooler. It may not be the same as, so every, every, Square miles different, you know. Watersheds are different, and so it's it. It takes a, a lot of different uh, activities. I would say, of course, I'm on the other side. Of, I get calls probably two to three times a day, maybe, or emails about how can I do this? What do I got to do? I had a neighbor call me, a classmate, the other night, and say, you know, looks like looks like we better get involved in this cover crop thing. We're like 25 years behind, you know. And that was like two days. Ago. I mean, so I. And if you go driving through Lime Creek Township or some of the townships in this area, there is a lot more going on. Now, I know if you look at the statewide, you know, in certain areas, maybe the numbers aren't there. But I guess we do, I think we are seeing changes. You know, we did get rid of the plow in northwest Iowa, but it took a long time to do No, that. we didn't. Yeah. Drive through northwest Iowa. Well, I understand that, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a a big we haven't one. gotten rid of it. Okay. But, you know, I have a good friend from Albert Lee. He's in one of our peer management groups, and he just sent a picture of um, him no-tilling soybeans into tall rye. But he strips, you know, he's planted into till strips, but he's got rye, and he's up there in I-90, you know, and that's a pretty good thing to be that far north, you know, and, and doing cover crops. And so it may not be as quick as what some people like, but I think if you... Um, if you get the system down and it works, then they'll tend to stick with it. Because I remember when they tried to push the no-till on us in the 80s, that didn't work too good. You know, that, they basically, the farmers rebelled, they just, nobody adapted it, and it just, all those plans, and I helped write those plans there and with Stan Simmons and there in Washington County, and none of those plans got adopted, and um, it, it just went to full tillage. The other thing, is the manure management plan, some of those plans require that you work that manure in, you know, and so when you work that manure in, all of a sudden now you're oxidizing, you know, and anytime you work the soil, you're going to loosen it and it's going to, you're going to stand your road, you know, and so some of our laws in place now kind of work against it, you know, like building terraces are generally a good thing, but when you put a riser there, you got an interstate highway really quickly to the to the streams. Now, I like terraces, we build terraces, you know, so we've got a lot of competing things going on here within our own laws, and I think if you just enforce what's on the books, just what's out there now, and I think waterways are wonderful, and uh, if you come to my farm, you can probably find 30 different places we should put waterways, you know, and so I think just enforce what's on the books, I think it's, it's slowly getting better. Um, you know, the, the one picture, you know, where we're dumping 6,000 gallons of manure surface supply over a tile line that puts out three parts per million of nitrogen on an average over probably three to four years, you know, why does that do that? You know, why doesn't, you know, and so, I mean, we got to be able to answer those questions, and I don't like, until we really know what's going on, I, I don't like to put it, I don't really like a lot of regulation until we know exactly what's going on and you know in a really leaky system too. And so but we know there's plenty to improve. We know we can cut our inputs. I know I can cut my nitrogen. I know I can cut my herbicides back. There's an economic incentive to do that. Your very large farmer is going to want to see that. And your very large farmer who's working with landlords on a daily basis to, to secure these properties, you know, 
that's where I think the landlord could put a little heat on some of these farmers too and start to lever it that way. If you can get one farmer that farms, you know, 5,000, 10,000 acres to slowly change, you know, then you start to see some big numbers move, you know, and so. Could you have a comment, a question? Give me well, it was kind of off, off the subject. Uh, neither of you mentioned much about potash. Uh, and potash evidently is not a, a, a major concern about the, the, the runoff and the... You've got, like, the phosphorus and nitrogen are the two. Yeah. And, and phosphorus, you know, we talk a lot about nitrogen. That's one that's usually limiting nutrient in the rivers and then the estuaries. But phosphorus is the one that's limiting nutrient in the lakes. You get all the algae blooms yeah, in the right. lakes, and that's phosphorus. Well, I, the, the thought I was wanting to know is: have, is there any detrimental effect no, seen in the the potash re being released out of the the residue back in that does affect any germination or or anything like that. Potash is released out of corn stalks, they say, fairly fairly quickly as they die and you get a uh, rain on them and so on. Right, that's why we late we, we wait the soil test late and then you know that's going to flush out into the soil and so you get higher potash readings the later you take it in the year. And the one thing on potash, we based on our soil test, that's one of the hardest nutrients we have we're having a real hard time trying to keep our potash levels up. If you'd look at ours, we're we're basically in the moderate to low on potash. And as our corn yields increase, we still need more potash. And, and that varies throughout the state and region, too. And I think if you go to western Iowa, that's not quite the issue. But Potash is a fairly significant component of the organic matter, of the organic matter in the plant. Uh, matter in, I, I'm not sure how it relates. Well, I think that for the water quality side, it potash isn't such a problem because uh, when it mineralizes, it's a, it's a K plus. It, it, it's um, a plus, and so it'll stick onto the soil. Soil. It won't, it's it not won't, very mobile, is it? Exactly. It won't, won't be so yeah. mobile in the soil like nitrate is. And phosphorus actually stays pretty well, too, because it's mostly held by the clay, by the calcium and the clay minerals and the, and the organic matter. So, but it goes so when you lose the soil, that's when you lose the yeah. phosphorus, yeah. Although now some of the soil tests are getting so high in phosphorus that um, from putting sometimes where the, 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 um, the liquid manure would be put on year after year after year, the phosphorus levels are getting way up there, and, and now more soluble phosphorus is starting to go out yeah. in the tile drains too. A um, couple of comments. What, what you said about the farmer after church that says, well, I'm not doing that again. It's up here. You know, if you're going to do something differently, you have to think differently. You have to do things differently. You can't cook an egg in the microwave the same way you do in a pan on the stove. Um, you talk about yields, and farmers have talked about yields for forever. That's The press puts that as the ultimate. When I lived in Fort Dodge, our egg committee of the Chamber of Commerce sponsored the Iowa Corn and Mas uh, Corn and Soybean Masters Contest. We also did a cost analysis. We got data from the farmers, what everything they did, seed costs, all that stuff. I remember the year that the farmer, out of 27 entries, who had the highest corn yield had the lowest net return. Because, and, and what we need is economics. Yeah, your maximum we need, economic yield. We yeah. need data. Rulons have put out some of the best I've seen with using strip till. Uh, cover crafts and stuff, but we need a lot more of it yeah. to prove to people that in the long run, this, you know, because they say, well, if I put out this much money for cover crap and all this stuff, it's costing me money. You know, even if I get, you know, some uh, reimbursement from the state, what we need is good data to prove. It's a long-term endeavor too, you know, and it, it, you got short-term, you know, money going out buying the cover crops, and but it's it's a long-term, you know, building up your soils, and I think we're starting to see that over time. But the farmer that's in and out, you know, if you get cost share tomorrow for for cover crop they plant it one year, the, the, the cost share goes away, then they don't, you know. And so, so if your soil organic matter goes up one percent, that soil will hold thirty thousand gallons more water in an acre, and that'll be available for the plants, and so. You start to have a lot more capacity to, to weather or drought and so on too. But 
it takes a while for that to happen. Well, see, they're looking at yields, and they're looking at the graph you put up there, corn. <laughs> and the beginning, fine. when we were starting yeah. promote no-till, uh, we did an economic uh, comparison of the different systems. And I think one of the reasons that it, ado it got adopted faster in Western County because they recognized it was cheaper to do no-till. Now, we hoped that the yields were comparable or within sight, but if you cut down from 12 trips, a lot of farmers were making 12 trips over a field uh, in a year, down to three. That's a very significant economic impact on, on uh, cost, fuel-wise, machinery-wise, uh, labor-wise, uh, put a lot of limitations on uh, how much you could do in, in the old system. And the, that's, economics is one of the major reasons why it grew fast. Yep. And they're cost shifts. I mean, we save some here, we spend more there, you know, um, on, on you know, cover crop seed, um, or on sprayers, you know, we spend more money, you know, on, on some machines, but we save other places. and. We think the overall benefit is basically the soil erosion savings, but as we get in and learn about the cover crops, you know, I think they're just uh, the soil quality. Uh, what we see the uh, the cover crops due to the soil is just it's unbelievable to walk across the field. I've been into so many fields all my life, you know, just you can just walk in a field that's been tilled, and it's like being on the floor. It's as hard as a rock, you know. And, once you're in a no-till field, it's just it's like it's like potting soil, and uh, it's resilient. And I think we can actually you know increase our yields maybe with less inputs you know over time. And, uh, so you know we're working on rotations. We know Matt Liebman at Iowa State's a good one to follow. You know he's he comes and brings classes to our farms all the time. Is always poking me to to try to get into some different rotations. And we gotta mention we're in Washington County, a very large. Hog County, and so you're going to need a lot of corn too, and so there is a lot of continuous corn, you know, and so they don't need the soybean. So you do have a lot of continuous corn, and it might be a little easier to grow organic matter over time with you know continuous corn. Although I think rotations are better over time, but um, and so. But um, maybe one last question. Yeah, Joseph. Well. Sort of seems like cover crops are making use of biomimicry. In other words, you're using a natural process to increase uh, soil fertility, and that that will create a, eventually an economic incentive to adopt that process. So I have two questions. One is, or maybe three. One is, um, after you make your investment, how long does it take to realize a profit that would be significant enough to attract farmers to do that more consistently? That's that's the first part of the question. I'll let you answer that and then that's the other two points. Well, that's a million dollar question. You know, it's, it's hard to know. Um, I mean, I, I go back to what I see and what I know. I, I know we're not losing soil erosion. Um, you know, the one, to me, there's no question that um, the system we're in now is beneficial, but I don't know if I can put dollars and cents on it. Everyone in the world's tried to do that from Iowa State and Mike Duffy and The Economist and try to calculate what a, a bucket full of soil is, you know. And, um, and so it, it, it's a payback, but it's, it's a long-term payback. You know, that's about as, about as good as I could say. We're just trying to get back to the way it was you when know, the pioneers you know, settled it. I don't know. My one great hope is that we, you know, before I quit farming, that we can start to see, you know, maybe a true increase in the organic matter. You know, that's a soil scientist question, you know, and my good friend, you know, Jason Steele said, well, that will depend by soil type, you know, how much you can bring that, that organic matter back, you know. But um, it, it's diversity of cover crops, you know, I'm just using one. Well, we use some oats. I, oats is wonderful. That's a great commodity cover crop we can use cereal rice. So the one thing we can do to improve is start to use different um, species, you know. That will help increase organic matter quicker, you know, and maybe work on that rotation, you know. I, um, we could use cattle in the operation, you know. That's what I need. I need a ruminant, 
you know. We got a lot of hogs, uh, but I need a I need a room in it in the operation, and so I'm not going to do that now. I'm by myself, and I've got enough to do. But you know, maybe I could partner with you know somebody else. But I think just diversity in general. So basically, try to be a, a livestock friendly state would be real helpful because we need that livestock, you know, to help you know with the rotations, you know, and so you know. A, a, if I, I could just mention that thing about that biomimicry. When you think about northern Iowa, where the last glacier left about 12,000 years ago, when the glacier left, there wasn't any soil at all. It was like a geologic wasteland. And only as plants and animals colonized that loose material and actually started to put organic matter in it, made soil, made some of the richest soils in the, in the world just from that biological process. Part of that process was the prairie grasses got really tall and deep rooted. And then the bison would come through and graze it off. And when it was short, it didn't need that deep root mass. So it's plus some of that root mass in the ground, grow new tops and more roots. And so each time we could graze, it would pulse organic matter deep and making the deep black soils. And, and so with our grazing system, we're trying to mimic that. And so we um, give the cows just as much as they can eat in one 12-hour period. Twice a day, they get fresh grass. And so the grass will grow up, and then we graze it off, and we try to get it all so that we keep the diversity. If, you, if, you, if they selectively graze, then they'll get they'll reduce the species down to monoculture, but we can continue to increase it by the diversity by letting them eat everything, and it's all in a lush stage. And then by the time they get around again, it's growing back up again, and they sort of put new roots in. So we're, I think we can build our soils pretty fast that way by, by that kind of a system, but you got to have the ruminants to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the second part of my question sort of feeds <laughs> off what um, Francis just said, and that is um, it seems like organic farming does move much more in that direction and organic farming also gives a premium for yields as does non-GMO farming. So I'm impressed with the fact that you have many different inputs and I'm wondering where would an input, let's say from non-GMO farming or organic farming, help increase the profitability of all these inputs that are trying to draw farmers into a more um, ecological and stable and sustainable way of farming that doesn't deplete the soil. That's sort of maybe well, for our next session. Well, one of the weak links of organic farming has been um, tillage because to control weeds you're not using chemicals, you're using more tillage. So that's why I'm really excited about this rolled down cover crop thing. So in my case, like in the fall, Usually you can get a good window without so much rain. It's not, in spring it's hard, you can get more erosion. You can get it in the fall too. But in the, in the fall, it seems like you can get the crop in with some tillage and get it up and going. And then you've got to protect it throughout the winter and in the spring. And then you can roll it down and have a lot less input for, for growing the crop. Um, so so I mean, we're just starting to learn how to do that sort of thing. So if I can relay that and come back the next year with Harry Vetch, and then you know, even though till it in, at some point, I'm probably going to get some perennial crops, perennial weeds I'm going to need to, to till with here and there, you know. And so, <laughs> however, the Rodale Institute out in Pennsylvania, they, they have been doing some organic research plots for many years now, like 30, 30 years or so. And they've been seeing their organic matter levels go up and up and up, like quite a bit, like well, three up to 6%. And they do have tillage in their, in their system. They do have tillage in, not everywhere, but they do have some tillage in. So, you know, you, you don't want to till any more than you have to, but if you have a, a real robust rotation, you can you can overcome some of that tillage thing too. But, but I'm sure that the the the, back, the fungi are going to be disrupted. So so there's all these trade offs, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's everything you do is a trade off, you know. And you, <laughs> I mean, it, it just comes back to one thing: is I, I don't see the erosion. That's the one thing I can hang on. I've been saying it all night, but that's about the only thing I can. Oh, your organic matter must be going up. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. But I, I also hard see to measure that. You can't, it's, so it, it's really hard just to get an accurate measurement, yeah, yeah. and I've seen a lot of farmers tend to overstate that, yeah, too. I, you know. I have, too. Yeah. And I've seen, if you just look at the numbers, you know, from a retail co-op that's out there poking the soils, like you see them go up, and then the first thing you start emailing and showing everybody, and then when they come back <laughs> down, then you just kind of forget them. <laughs> and so it's only as good as the test, but uh, so... We are doing, I would should say that we are doing a lot of plots, testing through the, um, um, the Soil Health Partnership, through the National Corn Growers Association, where I've got a 16-acre replicated four different times of four different nitrogen rates, one with zero nitrogen, just to see where we're at with zero nitrogen out there. And so we're, we're trying to learn how we can cut, you know, 
or maximize our economic, you know, you know, we're all the way to 300 pounds of nitrogen from zero, you know, and my guess is somewhere in between, like it always is, is the optimum, optimum rate. So, and but as you improve your soils, you're gonna, I think you're gonna have more bank nitrogen that you're yep. gonna use for those high, high demand crops. And we do see that. I mean, we're pulling tests every week, probably about twice a week now in a lot of these fields, and just watching where the nitrate levels are. And mm. so, plus, we're seeing what's coming out the tile lines too. And so, start testing, that's a good place to start to see where you're at. Let's give them a final round of applause. Thank you.